And so our didactic today is on steroid-induced hyperglycemia. Um, so, you know, the question for all of you is, if you, if you have a patient with diabetes or someone who's at risk for diabetes and they get treated with steroids, in particular glucocorticoids, we're not talking about androgens here, um, how do you recommend that they manage their blood sugars while they're treated with the steroids? To begin with, it's really important to know if they have prediabetes or do they have diabetes type one or type two understanding what the clinical condition that's being treated with the steroids is because being really ill can cause stress hyperglycemia in addition to any hyperglycemia that the steroids might cause. And then how hyperglycemic are they? And that will help you decide how to treat them. In addition, what type of steroid, how high of a dose and how often they get that dose and whether it's short-term or it's ongoing like a Medrol dose pack versus daily treatment for a condition like rheumatoid arthritis. And then whatever agent you're gonna to use to treat the high blood sugar, how does it work? How quickly does it work? What's its pattern of working throughout the day? And those are all things that you need to think about as you treat steroid-induced hyperglycemia. There aren't, I looked all over for guidelines um, and there are recommendations in, um, in the ADA guidelines, there is a guideline uh, out of the United Kingdom, but even then they say that there's really, these guidelines aren't guided by evidence. They're guided by pathogenesis, pharmacokinetics of the steroid, pharmacokinetics of the diabetes medication and clinical experience. If a patient, if a patient gets a real short course of steroids, they might not even need treatment. On the other hand, it could put them into diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmotic syndrome, and they may, may even need hospitalization. So sometimes it's hard to know. I worked on a liver transplant unit when I was in Atlanta, and I've had patients go into diabetic ketoacidosis with their first dose of uh, the steroid, and then I've had other patients hardly have a bump in their blood sugar. So obviously, it just requires a lot of attention. Um, some terminology, the use of steroid treatment in people with pre-existing diabetes will almost always worsen their glucose control, and that's called steroid-induced hyperglycemia. On the other hand, treatment with steroids can either unmask someone who has undiagnosed diabetes and kind of make it come to attention, um, or it can actually cause new onset hyperglycemia in somebody uh, with, with normal glucose in the past. The, in this situation, diabetes doesn't always go away when the steroids are stopped. And sometimes people end up with permanent diabetes after getting uh, steroid-induced diabetes or glucocorticoid-induced diabetes. Uh, the most common use for steroids in outpatients is respiratory disease like asthma or COPD. Second would be musculoskeletal, like gout, rheumatoid, lupus, or an intraarticular injection, like for knee arthritis. Also eczema and other skin illnesses, and then immunosuppression or chemotherapy. They can be administered, you know, put on your skin, inhale, taken orally, given intramuscularly, like a, a common thing around here for allergies is some big IM injection of steroids that's supposed to last three months. Um, and then the intraarticular injections, and some people will get a ton of them at one time, and they can actually get very cushionoid looking from intraarticular um, uh, injections. The most common use of steroids is for less than five days, but 22% are for more than six months and just under 5% longer than five years. But most common is that single short course of steroid in the morning. And, and the peak of the steroid effect is four to eight hours. We always said about six hours after the dose. So that's when the blood sugar is gonna be the highest. And then the effect of the steroid disappears and the blood sugar can often come back down to whatever it was before uh, overnight. Um, so that when you go to diagnose uh, steroid-induced hyperglycemia or steroid-induced diabetes, you use the same criteria that you would use for diagnosing any form of diabetes, but 
your fasting blood sugar is not going to be a good indicator, especially if they're taking that one dose of steroid in the morning. That is the most common form. So uh, probably the best, most reliable time to check is going to be after lunch. But sometimes with that four to eight, six hour uh, window is where you want to see the peak of the blood sugar. And then you're going to want to match that uh, with your treatment. So hemoglobin A1C is not a really good way to diagnose steroid-induced diabetes. It might be okay if you're seeing somebody coming out of the woodwork after having been on steroids for a few months already, and you could check to see what their A1C was, but otherwise it's not useful because it takes that two to three months or more for the A1C to register um, the change. But knowing what the A1C is before steroids might be really useful, especially when we're talking about a large number of people who have undiagnosed diabetes. Um, and then if they don't have pre-existing diabetes, but they're at risk, and we'll talk about the risk factors, then you want to start with at least one finger stick a day, either right before lunch or after lunch or before the evening meal. And if after the first week they don't show any increase, but they're going to be kept on steroids, you should have them continue to monitor because the most common time in people who are on chronic steroids for glucose-induced diabetes to show up is between the second and fourth week, not right at that first week. So how do glucocorticoids cause hyperglycemia or diabetes? It's a combination of increasing insulin resistance from the steroids themselves, plus the type of weight gain, which is fat gain, and muscle loss that steroids cause. Uh, steroids cause the liver to put out more sugar. So you've got increased insulin resistance, increased sugar coming out of the liver, and all kinds of bad effects on the beta cells causing reduced insulin secretion. So all three mechanisms have a role in um, causing the higher blood sugar with diabetes. Now, any dose uh, over the normal replace the normal amount made per day or what we would call the normal replacement dose of steroids, which is over five milligrams of prednisolone per day, can cause glucose, uh, glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia or diabetes. But the risk is much higher with the higher dose glucocorticoids, the longer the patient is on the glucocorticoids and the older the patient is. In addition, people who have elevated BMIs have had past glucose intolerance or impaired, uh, like somebody with prediabetes or somebody who had a history of gestational diabetes or somebody who had taken steroids in the past and had hyperglycemia, if they have a genetic predisposition to diabetes, or this again would be prediabetes, A1C over uh, 6%. Those are your patients that may get diabetes caused by the steroids and it may not go away, but they also could get severe hyperglycemia. So you're gonna to wanna to be sure just because they don't have diabetes now, doesn't mean that they won't get in trouble with the steroids. Um, the transient or temporary glucocorticoids was well over 50% of uh, steroid use. Um, and it's characterized usually by you start with a really high dose and then taper down, think medrol dose pack. And so the blood sugars can go really high and then start to come down as the steroids come down. Um, and so you need to get something on board right away. And everybody says here that insulin is the treatment of choice because the onset is now. Whereas like think about pioglitazone, you know, it's gonna take weeks or uh, for some other drugs to start working. And it can even take a while for metformin to start working. So with this type of um, treatment, uh, steroid treatment, insulin is going to be uh, the treatment of choice because it can be, the dose can be adjusted readily. Uh, you can find an insulin that matches the pattern and then it has the immediate onset. Um, as the steroid is tapered, it's really important that the patient know to taper the insulin. Um, so that, you know, this requires a lot of input from all of you who will be helping the clinician helping them, the patient and the clinician uh, with the steroids. So uh, humulin in or novolin in 
uh, actually match the profile pretty good and are commonly used for glucocorticoid because you've got the rise and then the steroids fall and the insulin falls. Um, an example would be to start with 10 units in the morning if the steroid dose is in the morning and then based on how high the blood sugar is to go up by 10 or 20%. But just like with uh, um, stress-induced hyperglycemia, like we talked about with COVID, you know, sometimes 20% increase is not enough and you may have to even go up by 40%. So here for this patient, instead of going up by one to two units each day, you might have to go up by as much as four units. Now I've never done this, but when you read the latest guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, they say with once or twice daily steroids, giving the NPH at the same time as you give the steroids on top of your basal bolus insulin or your oral medications uh, will work. And I have never given NPH on top of basal bolus therapy. I've always adjusted the basal bolus therapy and only used NPH in someone who was on oral medications or not on medication to start with. So, you know, so my disclaimer is I've never done this, but the experts who wrote the ADA guidelines say it's an option. If they're on uh, longer acting steroids like dexamethasone, or they're taking multiple doses throughout the day, or getting, you know, continuous glucocorticoids, maybe like the, the <clears throat> really intensive uh, um, topicals with the saran wrap and all of that, then uh, having um, the basal insulin added with the big caution that you still have to watch for that nocturnal and early morning hypoglycemia because of the waning effect of the steroids. And then the ADA says, as you get higher and higher doses of steroids, you need to add prandial and correction insulin. So meal time and correction doses to the basal insulin. Um, and, and that's what I've typically done if someone was on basal bolus, if I, I've uh, ramped that up. Mm -hmm. um, this is from the UK guidelines that if the if you are starting uh, NPH or basal insulin in someone based on the dose, so this is the prednisone dose, the dexamethasone dose, this is their recommended starting dose. So I just gave that to you as a little sheet sheet. Um, there are non-insulin therapies that you can think about, but, but this might be for people who are on longer term steroids um, and especially who have milder hyperglycemia. Um, so if you have a patient who was diet controlled or didn't have diabetes before, or they're controlled on oral agents uh, and they get put on steroids, they may either need a dose intensification. Let's say they were on metformin or glipizide. They might need the addition of an alternative agent or they might need to have insulin started. The concern with using a sulfonylurea is that you go up on the sulfonylurea dose, the glipizide dose, the glimiparide dose, but the steroid effect wears off before the sulfonylurea effect. And so there's a concern with hypoglycemia. They recommend if you start uh, insulin for someone with glucocorticoid induced uh, hyperglycemia or diabetes that you then uh, reduce or stop the sulfonylurea and that the, the the effect can be delayed. So it can take 48 hours for the steroid effect to wear off long-term and so that they need to keep monitoring really closely um, if you're gonna be using these agents. So sulfonylureas, which promote insulin release from the beta cell, regardless of what the blood sugar is. So they're different than GLP-1 agonists. GLP-1 agonists only cause release of insulin according to the high blood sugar. And if the blood sugar is normal or low, they won't cause insulin release, but not so with sulfonylureas. So you'd want to use a short acting one like glipizide. The guidelines also say maybe this would be a place to consider a glenide like Starlix or Prandin because they have shorter duration of action. The shorter duration of action can be a problem because they might not cause insulin release long enough but um, those might be an option for people that you don't wanna use insulin on. 
Metformin for someone like rheumatoid arthritis might be okay. Um, and there could be a lot of benefits to metformin, but it's not gonna be for that, that five day uh, person. And then pioglitazone theoretically would be beneficial, but it can take weeks and weeks for its onset of action. And think about the fluid retention you already get with steroids. Think about the bone loss you already get with steroids. So I would be a little bit worried about using pioglitazone here. Plus they have that slow onset of action. So uh, some of the newer medications, Many sources said that the GLP-1s and the DP-4 inhibitors uh, and, and their case reports and their studies showing that they work well. And one, one article said that they should probably be the drug of choice uh, because some of them, not Exendin-4, not uh, by Durion, but some of the others have faster onset of action. They primarily affect postprandial and they have a very low hypoglycemic um, risk. They have that tendency to cause naturesis, which might help with the edema. They have a good bone effect. They have a bone building effect and they um, don't cause weight gain. So people think that maybe uh, more, you know, as more and more studies come out that these might be the agents of choice. Now their case reports of SGLT2 inhibitors working very well. And then there's this study where they gave patients with COPD, some of them um, um, uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor and some of them not, and their blood sugars were the same. So some case reports go, wow, this worked really well, and others like it didn't work at all. So I think uh, to be continued here, but these look very, very promising uh, for steroid-induced hypoglycemia. So with type two diabetes, you wanna check the blood sugar at least four times a day. You wanna aim for blood sugars 100 to 180. You wanna be sure they have an updated education on diabetes and, and know that they can get in trouble quick, both with low and high blood sugar. If they're on glipicide, you can titrate that up, but be careful for the hypoglycemia. If they're gonna be on long-term, you can titrate up the metformin. If they're already on MPH and they're taking it at bedtime, which is the most common time to take it, move it to the morning to correspond with the dose. You may need to move to basal insulin. And then again, that warning for hypoglycemia. I hope, yeah, almost. And so what I did is I, I have a lot of references in the notes section, but I pulled out some of the references I used. And then I put some extra slides in here for you. Uh, I hope, I know I had to talk fast because I wanted to get it in, but you guys can have the slides. I hope that served as a refresher because this is something that you're gonna see a lot of, and it's gonna impact not just your patients with diabetes, but your patients with prediabetes, your patients with obesity. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions or comments. We do, yes, we do. We got a few more minutes. So if you have a question or a comment, please make sure to unmute yourself or if you're on the phone, star six. This is Robin. I have a type two diabetes patient that recently got diagnosed with cancer and he's getting chemotherapy with steroids in the injections every two weeks, I believe. He's on an infusion. And he was controlled with 7030 um, aspart insulin. And then his blood sugar is bumped up, but they're not up all the time just because he's only getting some infusions every two weeks, I think is a cycle. So what I did, and hopefully this is right, I put him on a correction factor aspart um, and I gave him a CGM so that he could correct it, you know, two or three times a day as needed while he's getting his infusions. Is it working? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And he well, loves the control. I would have done. So there's a slide in here that I didn't show you guys, but I mean, you can just adjust the 70, 30. Uh -huh. I probably would do what you did. You know, I, uh, just because there's more, more control there and less risk of giving too much in pH, you know, as the cancer patient, he probably has some anorexia after the chemotherapy and everything. So that's what I would have done, Robin, but <laughs> I do have a slide in there where they talk about just adjusting the 70-30. Yeah, I was afraid to do that because I didn't think he would fully understand yes. to yeah. go back down on the days that he doesn't need it. And yes. 
Okay. Uh, that's more what I do. Any anybody else have tricks to share with us? Uh, this is a very common scenario, and I've seen people get in trouble quick um, with steroids. <laughs> anybody else? Okay, you guys, get cases, get a case for us. And then also if you have a special request for, we have we have kind of a list of topics, but this steroid um, was a special request and it's something that is very, very common. And so I kind of took a side tour and developed that didactic because it's such a common problem and we actually hadn't thought of that. I think it was a really valuable one. I hope it. I hope it's valuable. And it was useful for me uh, to see that people really struggle writing guidelines on this. That it's more uh, clinical experience than evidence based. So, I want to say thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Colleen. This was a tricky case.